start. Uh, I welcome everybody. Uh, this is important. This is our first Department of Geosciences Advisory Board Distinguished Lecture. Uh, and our first guest, and I we are very happy to introduce him, is Dr. Jack Fashion, uh, our first distinguished lecturer. Speaking of uh, the advisory board, uh, do we have anybody from the advisory board? Paul <laughs> and Bob Fusick. So thank you very much for coming. So speaking of uh, uh, Dr. Passion, I think some of our graduate students have been know him for uh, some years. He has been visiting us. Uh, uh, he has been serving us on thesis committees of students, uh, studying with their thesis yeah. expenses a lot of the time. Uh, he is now a professor at Oklahoma State University. He's a professor and a devil chair there at the Boone Pickens School of Geology. Uh, he got his uh, degrees, the Bachelor of Science from Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and obtained his master's and PhD from the University of Kentucky. Then he joined uh, Geological Survey of Alabama for, and worked there for about 25 years, uh, served as the Chief of Coal Division and uh, Director of Energy Investigations Program then finally decided that he needs to go somewhere else. So, okay. he, <laughs> so he, uh, his, his research is diversified, and most of us know that, uh, focusing on petroleum geology, gold red methane, shale gas, coal geology, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, structural geology, basin analysis, uh, basin hydrology, and geochemistry. So, uh, he and he, I personally, you know, affiliated with him for quite some time. We had a project on um, work on uh, uh, petrophages and uh, the trital geochronology of the Black, Greater Black Warrior Basin. And he has been helping us, myself and Dr. Hames, as well as the students involved in the project very much. So he will be speaking to us on uh, the Pisoto Canyon salt basin. So it's basically some petroleum aspects and salt tectonics. So with that note, and after the presentation is over, uh, we'll go to halftime uh, around right after it, we walk downtown. If you've got warm enough clothes, <laughs> we'll, we'll be going downtown. It's just uphill from it's on College Street. It's uphill from uh, Cheeburger, Cheeburger. It's right next door to it. So please join us. We'll be there in about five to six. So yes, five to six. Okay. So that should be. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be here. And today, I'm going to talk about some research that is basically an extension of a lot of the work we would do in South Alabama. And what I'm going to give you is kind of a big overview of the DeSoto Canyon Salt Basin. I think a lot of you are familiar with the ultra-deep natural gas that's produced out of Jurassic sandstone under Mobile Bay, that's the up-dip edge of the DeSoto Canyon salt basin. So and that's just kind of the tip of the, of the trunk of the elephant. The elephant sits farther offshore and is largely unexplored. And uh, one, one of the things we found when we were looking at this salt basin is it's a nice model for how a lot of these Jurassic salt basins work in terms of their general uh, structural architecture, and in terms of, of the burial history, just all the all the depositional and structural styles we see. So one thing about <coughs> studies like this, this was done over a decade, uh, and really ended, the work ended around 08, 09, thereabouts, but the seismic has now been released, so I can, can talk a lot a lot of it. So, so the work I was done at the, at the survey, and on the intro slide, I Gohai Jin, and who's a structural geologist in Denise Hills, who's a, a geophysicist. Denise is now the new me at the, at the survey. And a lot of this work was funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and also a lot of the work was funded by the, the Department of Energy. Uh, and of course, all these people down here uh, were good, good sources of, of information, people who could bounce ideas off of, so we did a, 
come up with some, some interesting models for the evolution of the salt basin and the evolution of the drilling systems out there. And ultimately, the reason to do this kind of study is virtually all the natural gas produced offshore, Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi, has to come in through Alabama because the gas pop processing plants are because the state has a huge interest in this. But when you look at what's actually produced relative to what's out there, there's a huge exploration frontier. So when the federal government looks at leasing offshore areas, they pre-prospect everything. They want to know the structural style of the petroleum systems because they don't want to waste anyone's time by offering lease blocks that basically aren't drillable. So a lot of what we do is really quite speculative exploration, just kind of high grading the opportunities out there. So, you know, there are two things you need to know about salt if you're not familiar with salt tectonics. And a lot of this will, you know, you'll see as I really start showing you a lot of these examples. First, salt is extremely ductile. So it just floats. And salt is buoyant. It wants to rise upward. So you when know, rocks start forming, you know, critically load salt, it just starts flowing out of the way to make room for faults to move, and it starts welling upward to make large salt pillows, just big ant lines poured by salt, and, uh, and to make salt die appears. Okay, the other aspect of this talk is petroleum system, and it's a word that's bandied about a lot, and its definition is, is actually fairly complex. It goes to uh, uh, Les Lagoon and Wally Dow's AAPG memoir on the subject, and it goes back to some early ideas, some what people call the petroleum machine, the idea that petroleum resources are the result of an integrated geologic system. Right? So it's not just oil sitting there, you know, it went from a source rock, migrated somewhere, accumulated underneath it in a high spot underneath the seal for conventional reservoirs. So you know, according to the definition, you know, a, a, a petroleum system is an integrated geologic system incorporating source rocks, all related oil and gas, and all essential elements and processes for oil and gas accumulations to exist. Well, that's really a loaded statement. So you know, what are the essential elements? Right? You need a source rock. Without a source rock, there is no petroleum system. Okay? You need a, a migration pathway. Uh, you need a seal. Right? And you need a track. Those are the, the essential elements of a petroleum system. Uh, processes are Expulsion, <clears throat> you know, generation, expulsion, migration, and accumulation. So those are really the four major processes that govern the origin and distribution of, petrol of petroleum. So our approach was quite diverse. Uh, there are a few wells out there, so we did a lot of uh, well-based characterization and interpretation. Uh, seismic interpretation is really the core of everything we do offshore. There aren't that many wells out there, but it's really easy to shoot seismic in the marine realm, and the imaging is just quite good. Uh, and so we did a lot of seismic interpretation and 3D modeling using a slumber J package called GeoFrame. It's been uh, supplanted now over the last couple of years by, uh, by Petrel. And a lot of structural interpretation using a uh, and various uh, structure packages like 3D Move, LipoTech software, which actually be used for depth conversions and things like that. And a uh, rather simple approach to basin modeling, just looking at burial histories, tracking reservoirs and source beds and seals from the time of deposition to ultimate preservation and deep burial, and you can use that to determine you know, the timing of petroleum generation, the timing of, of expulsion, things like this. So yeah, how when did things get cooked and how much did they get cooked? In other words, how long, yeah, when did the cake get into the oven and how long did it bake? Time and temperature, two fundamental concepts in, in petroleum formation. And then we did a petroleum systems analysis uh, just following the, the Magoon and Dow approach, <laughs> just looking at you know, what are our candidate source rocks, what are known petroleum accumulations, where could we have other accumulations? Where are our seals? Things like that. So we'll we'll run through that. It's a fairly simplistic approach, but it's, it's proven effective. So to get uh, get things set, this is what the Gulf of Mexico, if 
was really a gulf at that point. It is thought to have looked at uh, around the end of the Jurassic. So pretty, pretty complicated ar arrangement there. So the DeSoto Canyon Salt Basin sits in a little embayment here. Really thick Jurassic salt is shown here in, in the orange, although the limit of salt really went all the way around, around this area. You can see that we're just getting spreading centers developed. The Gulf of Mexico is now thought to be largely rotational. Uh, the Atlantic was, was opening up pretty well with the South Atlantic and all just in the incipient stages of opening. So we have tiny ocean basins at this point. And one thing to keep in mind is that as this big hole is opening, right, the continent has rifted, we're getting uh, young oceanic crust, and all the salt wants to slide down into that hole. And that's what part of what drives the salt tectonics. So it's not only just the buoyancy and ductility of the salt, it's the fact that you're making a big hole and all this ductile material wants to flow right down into it. So here's the, the study area, and this gives you an idea where we have really good 3D seismic control, 2D seismic lines all over, all over here, and some newer 3D shoots <coughs> in here. They don't tell us anything too terribly new about that, that area. So here, here's Mobile to get you uh, located. There's Mobile Bay, uh, Pensacola, you know, Gulf Shores, that's all over there. So it's really just right in our backyard. And see these dots, those are the north lip gas wells uh, outside of Mobile Base, and that, that accounts for 10% of the state's general fund budget, just the, more, the interest from the royalties. So it's kind of an important thing for, for uh, everyone in the state. Everyone who lives in Alabama, you are a leaseholder. <laughs> you own that. You get royalties from it. So the stratigraphic section is your classic South Alabama type stratigraphic section. So at the base of the pile is a mid-Jurassic salt, the Luan salt. That's the, got the same name everywhere we look around the Gulf of Mexico. Above that is a mid-Jurassic Aeolian sandstone, kind of like the Navajo, the same age, the Northlake Formation. That's the the biggest gas producer in the state. Then above that is a thick carbonate succession, late Jurassic, the, uh, the smack, over, smack over formation, smack over limestone. The middle part of the smack over is slightly organic rich, barely organic rich, but it's considered the only credible source rock in the pile in this part of the world. And the smack over onshore is made, has major reservoirs uh, in, the, in the upper part, and above that is a thick evaporite and carbonate section called the Haynesville Formation. It's a famous shale formation, shale gas formation part of the west in Alabama. It's mainly, mainly evaporites. As we move offshore, this does pass into carbonates. We lose the evaporites. And then above that is a very thick plastic section called the Cotton Valley Group. Uh, it's largely been interpreted as, uh, as uh, braided stream deposits, bedload dominated fluvial deposits. And in this upper part where it becomes shaley, as we move offshore, we start picking up some additional limestone units at the top, something called lot, the Knowles limestone offshore, which has almost never been drilled. Just a few wells constrain that. Okay, when we look in a seismic profile, this is a, a transect from the edge of the salt basin down into the middle of the salt basin. So here, you know, if you drill the, the smack over, which is in the dark purple, yellow is the Northlit sandstone here, you'd be drilling wells about 20,000 uh, feet in depth. Uh, farther down here, you, know, you could end up being you know, 30 to 40,000 feet in parts of the salt basin or even deeper than that. So, largely out of range of, of, of drilling. I don't think anyone's drilled much deeper than 26,000 in the Gulf of Mexico. And so, in pink, this is the basement surface here. So, big non-conformity where salt sits on 
uh, igneous metamorphic and, and some sedimentary rocks. A lot of this is thought to be Jurassic Age, early Jurassic volcanic wedge. So just lots of volcanics when we see we're dipping reflections in that red section there. And then here's the Luan salt sitting in all these discontinuous bodies uh, above that, that nonconformity. And here we have a series of faults. And notice that the Jurassic strata, the Northlet smackover section on that, and the hang walls of those faults, they just plop on down to the base of salt. They just roll over folds. Uh, just sitting there grounded on the base of salt. And you know, there are big faults that go up into this section. And these typically form, we call them peripheral faults. They form seaward of the basinward of the landward limit of salt. So we usually get some critical salt accumulation, then we get these big normal faults. And then see this great big anticline right here. That's called Destin Dome. Very famous large anticline. These are these generally form really big reservoirs in the Gulf of Mexico basin. No one's made a well in it here above the Northland. The Northland is productive in Destin Dome. And this big body of salt here is what we call a salt pillow. And above it is just a salt cord anticline. And here's a little salt pillow, a satellite to that bigger salt pillow. And uh, so we at least don't image Northland sandstone out here. Uh, there is a well that Chevron drilled way offshore where no one's seen it, but they made oil out of it. So it probably goes a lot farther than we thought. One thing to note about salt is, uh, is, is since the strata are, notice that they're deformed, but they, they lose dip upward, so they record the movement of the salt, growth strata. We have growth faults, growth folds, and then above the, the salt here, here we have the satellite salt pillow. Uh, this is one of the fun things we get to do with salt, is here's a nice anticline. See, at this level, this is the top of the Cotton Valley group I talked about. There's an anticline there, but by the time we get into the lower Cretaceous section, no structure. It's a syncline, a syncline sitting right on an anticline. Just shows that the structural movements in salt provinces can be pretty complex, and we'll see some pretty fantastic changes in the relationship. So, essentially, this grew early, right, and it was gone by the by the lower Cretaceous. And yet, this big Destin Dome pillow it deforms everything up to just about the sea floor. Doesn't look like it's active now, but it was certainly active uh, into the Oligocene and later. Uh, by uh, deformation on the top of this, this orange bed there. So that's one good thing about salt basins is the sedimentary strata record all the structural movement. And that's a very powerful tool when we interpret seismic profiles. And so out here are, are a pair of salt diapirs. Here's a classic uh, vertical salt stock. It's nicely imaged there. Um, Diapirs can have a variety of expressions. This one has a big pressful fault system. <coughs> Those tend to be big producers onshore, but they tend to be a little too small to develop offshore. Then here's a big salt diapir, not really well imaged, but it's got a big cap rock reflector, usually a concentration of, uh, of anhydrite and other minerals at the top of the, of the salt level. That nearly comes to the, comes to the surface. So they offset big sections. So they're, they're kind of a, a different story than a lot of what goes on above these salt pillows. OK, so looking at the undeformed stratigraphy. So here's the basement. There's the Luan salt. There's no Norflit imaged out here. But here's the smack over. And you can see very nice planiform geometries there. So, shingled clinoforms, prograding carbonate bank is the story for the smack over. Uh, the Haynesville sits on that, and there may be some truncation of reflectors at the top. We might see some better truncation in a couple of minutes. But here's the Cotton Valley, dominated by plastics. There is a well way out here to actually hit coal in it. It's common in the lower Cretaceous, the lower Cretaceous plastics with coal. It's a long way offshore. That was the shore during the Jurassic. And then here are those knolls 
latest Cretaceous, earliest, earliest, uh, or latest Jurassic, earliest Cretaceous carbonates at the top. Okay, so here's one of those satellite salt pillows. Okay, you can see the seismic there. Here's the interpretation. Okay, there's the nonconformity. Look at the this salt pillow is isolated. The the uh, smack over carbonates just sit grounded on the the base of salt there. Just all flowed out of the system. Okay, here we have a big anticline. And note. It's completely truncated. Beautifully imaged angular unconformity. So that's a very early, early structure. So you know, it looks like the this was this and the, the Haynesville were, were truncated uh, at the start of Cotton Valley deposition. And there is normal Cotton Valley and, and moles carbonates at the top. So pretty complex system. Maybe a little bit of drape folding and faulting at the top there. When we map things out, we see that the peripheral faults, those up-dip faults, they tend to be very discontinuous, form a regionally branching system, not uncommon. If we look along these, you know, onshore, it's where a lot of the smack over production is, an equivalent structural position in Choctaw County, uh, and into uh, Clark County in that area. Okay, then here are some of the big broad salt pillars. See that nice little blue thing there, and some of the satellite pillows are just these tiny little bumps there. And look at all the salt diapers out in the middle of the salt base. <coughs> okay, so that's a common sequence we see is you know, edge of salt, peripheral faults, large pillows, smaller pillows, diapers. So that's commonly the sequence we see. Okay, when we map these things through, through time, we can uh, decompact each layer and map them up, about and do 3D models based on the, the seismic control. So when we look at, you know, if, 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 uh, the, uh, during the, the early Cretaceous, by that time, the, uh, we had a ridge forming with all those little pillows. There are the satellite pillows, latest Jurassic. Uh, Actually, yeah, 140. That's uh, latest Jurassic. We see these pillows, and they form an, an arcuate trend. See that ridge? Just a big arcuate trend, and here we have a big withdrawal syncline that some of the salt flowed out of to inflate those pillows. There are the peripheral faults there. Uh, by the time we move up a notch, I can't read this from over here. Oh, okay. We see a big area has evacuated. The satellite pillows are no longer obvious, and we're starting to inflate a big salt pillow here. Something you call ancestral Destin Dome, and here we see the peripheral faults in all their glory. We have really good seismic control there. Okay, and on the main Destin Dome, we had an interesting, interesting uh, finding there. As it started forming, you know, about a hundred million years ago, there it is. That western pillow, ancestral Destin Dome, it's dead. It's gone. It's no longer filling up with salt, and the peripheral faults are there. You know, we would have thought early on if you would have asked me that I thought these pillows were somehow related to the peripheral faults. They're not. They're not there. And then here is the modern Destin Dome, you know, by uh, 23 million years ago. So, uh, so basically by Eocene time, there it is, just all the well, And here is, is a typical Mobile Bay well. This is one of the state leases. At the base of the sandstone, usually sits on a little anhydrite bed. So there's, there's calcium sulfate down there. And then we go through the reservoir sandstone. Some can be filled with water. This one just happens to be gas all the way up. Then we get what's called the tight zone. When you look at that sandstone, it's filled with, with pyrobitumin, just charred oil, just the residue of oil. So these were emplaced as oil reservoirs. And at the very top, part of the seal system is actually a pyrite bed, 
See, the de this is the density log here, very dense layer. And we get a sample of the sandstone. It's just solid cemented with pyrite. And the explanation for that is thermochemical sulfate reduction related to the evaporites in the system. And it may have to do a lot with also uh, sulfate in the, in the brine and formation water. That may be as good as, as the evaporites as a source for, for some of this stuff. But what the general idea is, oh, this was emplaced as oil. There's the evidence for the oil. There's the ancient oil water contact. And all that oil was converted, cracked down to natural gas. And so it expanded, expelling all the water. So when we map this out, here's uh, some of the Mobile Bay wells. This is up in, in the, in the Bon Secours Bay field in Mobile Bay, and a series of wells. The tight zone is shown in the orange. So there's your fossil oil water contact, and here's the, it's in the tight zone. It's all filled with gas now. In the main gas reservoir, see how much expansion from the original oil accumulation there's been to natural gas. It's just displaced the water down, downward through the gas drive reservoir. So uh, that gives you an idea of what, the, what these reservoirs are like. So that's why we you know, may have been an oil prone source in place as oil. It's all gas now just because it's gotten that hot for that long. So you know, just a little, little 3D model conceptual cartoon, there's the tight zone, right? There's the sandstone draping over the rollover fold, you drill the eyes, that's where you make the reservoirs, there's the main, main gas body, and the lower part of those lenses are generally filled with water. If you drill an extreme high, right, drill one of the flanks, you'll get gas, right, all the way down. But if you drill one of these, you know, they're up to 2,000 feet thick, uh, the lower half of it can be just really good. Okay, when we look at you know some of the things that are more speculative, we know the smack over is a big producer on the shore. We have the source strata in the lower smack over, basement highs either side, and the big reservoirs are you know the oolite shoals that are just loaded with oil uh, up around Choctaw County, Clark County, that area. And then bioherms and little shoals loaded with, uh, with natural gas and condensate in the Mobile area, around Hatter's Pond, Chinchula, I don't know if you've heard of some of those fields. Well, if we look offshore, and we have kind of a similar relationship where we think we have the lower smack over source rocks, and maybe on the salt, you know, salt rollers we had some shoals, and that probably extends on up into the, the larger salt pillars. So that we, we Suggests is one of the possibilities is we have source rocks charging what could be shoal type faces on top of the salt rollers. Right? So growth system, you know, is probably going into deeper water from a salt from you know, salt high on down into the lows. So there may be a built-in source rock reservoir system. And this is what we do when we evaluate petroleum systems. Say, okay, here's a source rock, essential element. That's when it was deposited. The only one we know of that's a candidate are the mid smack over carbonates. Reservoir rocks, well, we know the Northlet's proven. The smack over Haynesville and some of these other things may be producers elsewhere. We don't know, but it's worth, it is worth testing. Seal rocks, you know, we know that some of the smack over stuff is proven as seals because it's sealing the known Northlet hydrocarbon accumulations, but there are plenty of other evaporite and shale seals, other things uh, higher in the section that may come into play. And then we have the overburden rock. That's just everything that the rocks got buried under so they could be cooked. <laughs> so that's one of the, the uh, essential elements. And we know from you know the major trap formation was very early. Okay, so most of this is very, yeah, the salt rollers were early. Most of the salt pillows, except for Destin Dome, were very early. And uh, so the traps were there long before we started generating hydrocarbons. So they were waiting to be charged. Here I am, charge me. That's good if you're, if you're an explorationist. You know, if you can prove you've got early structures, 
you make a lot of you'll get a lot of investors. Uh, then preservation time. This is how long it's been cooking. Anything that end of generation accumulation. Any structure that forms later is late to the dance. And uh, so, so that's our kind of critical moment. So that's one of the ways we look at petroleum systems. Where, where are our elements? How they stack up in time? That's actually a very important aspect of what's done. Pay attention, IBA group. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you know, going back to you know, how does it all stack up? I've thrown a lot of stuff at you during this lecture. Remember, there are the peripheral fault. We may have prospects along there. Proven Norfolk Reservoirs, there are those, those highlighted in yellow sandstone lenses. Then we have all the smack over, which we know is great onshore, and it comes way up on these huge structural highs. So you know, here, here it's high, here it's, you know, here it's low, and you know these were growing during depositions. They may have source rock down here and reservoir rock there. And then we have the Cotton Valley above, and we get the Lower Cretaceous Reef Trend, which produces a lot of places, so there may be more prospects there. So we take what we took from the basic petroleum systems analysis, take our understanding of the regional geology, and put it together into a petroleum systems model. So right, this is all proven up here. We know what works. We know what doesn't. And our speculative reservoirs are all, especially in the Diapir and, and Salt Roller Province, this model certainly focuses on the Salt Roller Province, but it looks like there are some structural closures and things that are big enough to draw people's attention. You can find the equivalent of a 100 million barrel field. That's what people produce offshore. They've got to be big. So that's generally what you think. So here's the proven production. Every time you pop one of these Northwood sand bodies, we find. And we've got speculative uh, possibilities sit in the smack over at Haynesville and Cotton Valley as we go offshore. And we're really looking strictly at gas here. It's all so deep. So to wrap up, the uh, you know, Jurassic Petroleum System in the Pacific Canyon salt basin is pretty diverse. You have clappy evaporates, carbonates. In plastics, with the sands being the, the proven reservoirs, both in the sand. Uh, structure includes all kinds of things peripheral faults, broad salt pillows, salt diapers, rollers, and structural chronology is extremely complex. Every one of these structural types has its own evolution and timing, so you just have to look at them individually. Uh, Smack over source rocks and proven nor northward reservoirs are, are at the northern end of the basin, and uh, but the smack over Cotton Valley potential out there offshore, farther offshore, uh, is substantial, but we have to note that it's speculative. If you haven't drilled it, you haven't proven it. So it's out there to out there to be proven, and that's the kind of stuff people would consider leasing offshore. And uh, when you look at the whole system, you have a very long history of subsidence, right? Southern has just been sinking pretty continuously since the, the Jurassic. It's been just cooking. It continues to cook today to the point where we may have replaced all the petroleum as oil. But as far as we know, every last bit of it was cracked by thermal maturation to, to natural gas. And that's the story of the Soto Canyon Salt Basin right in our backyards. Thank you.